everybody, you're listening to Sit Down with Stand-Ups, I'm Ari Azizian, and this week's episode comes to you live from San Francisco, and it's such an honor to speak with my guest this week, he's a five-time Emmy nominee, he's been on Letterman, and he's in a great new comedy documentary called Three Still Standing, which will be premiering next week, April 29th through the 30th at the Toronto Hot Docs Film Festival. Uh, he's a San Francisco icon, he's a legend, he's a great comedian, I'm speaking with Mr. Will Durst. <laughs> Milwaukee originally? Uh, the Milwaukee area, New Berlin, Muskego, West Dallas, Waukesha. And yeah. then I went to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, graduated from Waukesha South, the same high school that Frank Caliendo graduated oh, really? from. Yeah. Wow. So I'm not even the most famous comedian from my high school, which <laughs> pisses me off. <laughs> Were you guys around the same time? No, no. 20 years. 20 years, okay. I was class of 70, he was class of 90. Yeah. And did you start stand up there out in Milwaukee? I did. I always wanted to be a comic. I had watched all the late night shows. Yeah. And went, oh, that's cool. And then uh, I saw this show. Uh, they used to have a, a, a syndicated program called Playboy After Dark. Oh, yeah. And it was hosted by Hugh Hefner. And it was one of the first syndicated programs. And they ran it, I think uh, our NBC affiliate ran it in Milwaukee on Saturday night you know, in the time slot of the Tonight Show. And it was Hugh Hefner with this bevy of buxom, beautiful <laughs> bombshells. And uh, and uh, so every week they'd have an entertainer or, you know, a book, a poet, or, you know, they were heavy with the beats. And uh, so one time this comic comes on and he's wearing a, a shiny suit and a skinny black tie. And uh, the comic comes on and does a little routine, and I thought it was funny, but I noticed the reaction, and all the all the women were, were paying <laughs> attention to him now yeah. instead of Hugh Hefner. Right. And I had watched this show three or four times. Nobody had ever done this, and I thought, <laughs> that is the coolest thing ever, that the chicks dig the comic. Yeah. You know? So um, that was, I think that was very formative. Uh, uh, so I always wanted to be a comic. Since you were a kid, you knew, like, from watching Tonight Show and yeah, yeah. that show. That was, like, before also, SNL on Saturday nights, oh, they yeah. play that? Yeah. Comedy was a uh, humor was a big thing in my family because I have a brother who's developmentally disabled, uh, Marky, my younger brother by two years. And um, he's, he's, he can understand, but he can't speak, and you don't know how much he understands, and... You know, they have an IQ of an eight-year-old, you know, and you don't know, and they just make stuff up. And But uh, making him laugh was a, a big thing around the dinner table yeah. for my, my mom and my dad and my stepdad, not so much, but my, you know, everybody. <laughs> right. Uh, so making Marky laugh was was the big deal. That's awesome. That's so like the, whole the best family way to communicate, was, like, it's through humor. It was. Everybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And to make Marky feel like part of the family. Cause yeah. He couldn't discuss, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, but right. you can make him laugh, and he can make you laugh, yeah. which he did at times, you know. That's awesome. I, I heard, like, your father and grandfather read, like, three newspapers a day, you said, and you that's yeah. where you sort of got into... Well, I just got used to it. I, I lived in a household where there were always newspapers, and people were reading newspapers, so uh, I became, you know, familiar with them, and then I started... At, you know, just like anything that you do over and over and over again, you you start becoming more uh, particular and you consider yourself an expert, you right. know, and stuff like that. So my my father read three newspapers and my stepfather read. And we only had two dailies in Milwaukee. So he had to augment that with uh, either the Chicago Tribune, which was available in newsstands, you know, or there were local, you know, the rags, you know, like. Would you try to like do some jokes like Johnny Carson, like in the monologue, just take them from the newspaper? Or did you start writing jokes before you knew you wanted to do stand up, or were you performing? No, I started writing in high school. Okay. Um, I started performing in high school. I was not a very good basketball player or football player, 
or baseball or golf, but <laughs> I could run. Yeah. And so I, I ran cross country and I ran track. And I was getting to be a good little low hurdler. And then I broke my foot. And so uh, I was able to audition for, I couldn't, I couldn't run track that, that spring. So I auditioned for the spring play. And I think it was Mr. Roberts or something. Uh -huh. And previously I had filled in for a guy because I had a good memory. And some guy dropped out of our school production of Our Town, the stage manager, and I memorized it in a weekend. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. The, and it's a big part. So, Were there uh, any funny scenes? Did you, was that where, like, the first laugh sort of came from? Uh, no. No. The stage manager, a couple of uh, wry observations, but no real laughs. Yeah. Uh, but, but that it, feeling to perform in front of an audience was, like, in high school when you really started to enjoy it? Or? Yeah. Yeah. When people are are looking at you for the right way because i was always uh the new kid in class uh my parents moved and uh, because of my generation with the the huge explosion of the baby boomers they were always building new schools and stuff so um i was always the new kid so uh i went to 12 different schools for, before i graduated from high school and then i went to wow that's yeah. four college three college one two three four four colleges and uh yeah and then and then uh but i was writing for the school newspaper in high okay. school and college and i took some journalism when i went to college i took journalism and theater and film and broadcasting oh very cool. so i wanted to go into film but because uh, I wasn't getting any parts in theater, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't they wouldn't cast me, and I knew, damn, I uh, I got in got into a play with uh, Willem Dafoe. Do you know him? Yeah. He's an actor. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. He he went to my same college, U University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Wow. So, so I was in a play with Willem Dafoe. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It was amazing, uh, <laughs> and then, um, but because nobody would cast me, because I had kind of this lumpy face that wasn't real you know uh, it wasn't a way to typecast me I, was, I wasn't the uh, the best friend next door I wasn't a leading man I wasn't a villain I wasn't a character so that's why I knew I had to do stand up comedy and I and uh, uh, my teacher performing arts uh, Herb Felsenfeld was the professor's name and he signed everybody in the class uh, the fact that we had to do a, a performance piece, just a performance piece. And I chose stand-up comedy. So oh, cool. I cobbled together all the funny parts from my columns that I had written. Yeah. And I stole some jokes from Woody Allen. <laughs> and I just took some funny things that happened in my family. And I said, and I had seven minutes. And I memorized it. Which, of course, as you know, it's is the hardest easy. part. Yeah. No, no, it's the hardest oh, I thought, part. Because you had the weekend. Well, I, the I can memorize, but memorizing the, is, the you know, especially that seven minutes, yeah. you know, where am I going with the next one, you know? Uh, so uh, I bought a case of beer and I brought it into class. We used to have these triangular stamped tin ashtrays that were all over the university and they were disposable and. And I brought like five of them from the student union into the classroom, and I closed all the windows. You like made, made a, a club. Dark. Yeah. I made a comedy club. <laughs> I let them smoke and drink, and they loved that part. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and I sold the beer for fifty cents a piece. So I actually made like two dollars and forty cents wow. on my first gig ever. That's amazing. I know. I know. Um, and then um, I had seven minutes, and there was a local open mic. This was nineteen seventy four. And uh, my first gig in a real club was on November 4th, 1974, a comedy club, a uh, place called The Rusty Nail. The Rusty Nail, okay. And so I showed up because I had heard about it, you know, because how you, you know, you kind of circle something that you're approaching. Right. And, and you learn, well, I'm not ready. You know, <laughs> like, you get a little closer and, oh, okay, oh, that's where it is. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, well, I'll come back next week. And then I know where it is now. Right. And, and that's what I did. You I kept going watching other people perform. No. Oh, you just I waited went in, until it went was in. ready, yeah. Where do I sign up? <laughs> I don't know how I had the balls to do that. Where do I sign up? But Thinking the first one you did in class with the, you turned into a comic club, that go really well? 
the kids were smoking and drinking in class. Yeah. You know, they were laughing. They they weren't expecting comedy. I I had some actual jokes there because of Woody Allen, thank right. God. You know? <laughs> um, the moose joke. <laughs> <laughs> the moose came in second. <laughs> Very nibbish. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so um, the first time you went to the nail or the rusty nail, rusty nail. Whatever, and I, and because I had some stage time, I had been in plays and stuff. I was familiar with the. I wasn't nervous. I was the third best out of wow. out of about like eleven guys who went up that night. That's so cool. And it was very interesting because the rusty nail uh, was close to a, a college called the Milwaukee School of Engineering (MSOE), and they had adopted the place as kind of like their hangout. You know, all these kids from MSOE who were kind of engineering nerds. You know, yeah. I mean, before there were computer nerds, there were engineering nerds. Right. And so they adopted the place, and they had foosball tables and um, pinball machines, and it was Monday night football. It was because it was always Monday night. So they had to turn off Monday night football, oh, okay. and they had to turn off the foosball tables. Yeah. And the so, and uh, the, guy, the kids from MSOE thought this was their turf and they objected <laughs> to having their turf sullied by the so they would stay and they would try to sabotage your act by yelling out the punchlines because they were there every week the right. same crew so I learned how to arrive at the punchline on a circuitous route you know never the same setup and I think that helped a lot it was an unusual kind of spice to throw into the exactly yeah. the mortar that I was being pestled in or the pestle that I was mortared in. No, I totally know that feeling. There's a, like a sports bar in LA that it has a Monday night open mic and the TVs are just going with football mic. Like, I can't compete. No. There's no way I can get no. these guys' attention. No. <laughs> but, that's that's wrong. Yeah. You can learn lo- wrong shit on the road. You can learn bad stuff on the road. You always have to shoot throw the ball like the, the the audience is a wide receiver, you know, throw it so that they have to run to catch it. You can't do all button hooks where right. you just stand in there and <laughs> you just keep nailing because you got nowhere to go exactly. after that. I thought you I know? read some football jokes that didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not quite what I mean, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so you gotta you gotta always give the audience the benefit of the doubt and make them stretch. Yeah, and absolutely. Run for the joke. <laughs> run for the joke. And then how many years uh, did you perform there before you... Did oh, you went to San Milwaukee? Francisco first? Yeah. Or? I was there for about five years, almost five years to the day. Cause wow. I, uh, the first day I moved to San Francisco in 79 was November 4th. So oh, cool, yeah. I kept doing it, and we had open mics. And the thing was, in Milwaukee, the city itself, comedy is illegal because of really? a bizarre licensing law that... Um, when they wrote the municipal codes for entertainment back in the 50s, comics were MCs for strippers, so they wrote them under the same oh. license. So to this day, if you want to charge money for a stand-up comedy show in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you have to buy an exotic dancing license. Oh, my gosh. I know. So we had some burb. We had, uh, there was a place called Jacks Are Better out in Wauwatosa, which was right across the Milwaukee border, the city of Milwaukee. And there was some stuff on the south side. But it would run for eight months and then die and then pop up somewhere else you know in Chicago they had a couple of places they had the Comedy Cottage and the Maroon Raccoon but as soon as they found out I was from Milwaukee they would put me on first or last you know as cannon fodder you know yeah because they would reserve prime time for their local boys which is only fair and right and true and just you know but uh I wasn't getting any good stage time, you know. I was just getting. Uh, come on, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> these these jokes are funny. I've tried them before, <laughs> and they actually listen. If you listen, look for the joke, it'll be there. Uh, so, and then you it came was to frustrating. San Francisco and and then I came to San Francisco. That was like nine, mid seventy or late seventies. Oh, well, seventy nine. Seventy nine. I uh, there were three places where you could earn your living at stand up comedy, and they were. Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco. Not New York or L.A. Wow. Because as you know, everybody's willing to do it for free, for exposure. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. The whole comedy strike with the store. And, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. that's so cool. So over here, there's Punchline and Cobbs and... At the time, there was... Uh, Holy City Zoo. The Holy City Zoo. The other cafe was just starting to have a stand-up comedy, I think, two nights a week. And there was the Intersection, the Mustard Seed, a bunch of places. Uh, and the punchline, of course, which had been the dressing room for 
the old Waldorf when Jeffrey Pollack owned it. And then John Fox, the the producer, not John Fox, the comedian. <laughs> so they're they're always differentiated with John Fox, the producer. <laughs> uh, he kind of wangled his way into the San Francisco comedy competition. And the second and third year, he had the finals in what is now the Punchline and oh, okay. turned it into a comedy club. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's how the Punchline became the comedy club. And so I moved here. And in Playboy, <laughs> and a lot of my career seems to revolve around Playboy, <laughs> but Playboy magazine did a thing on Robin Williams right after Mork happened, you know, 77, 78, maybe 70, maybe early 79, I can't remember. But uh, they did a sidebar on the Holy City Zoo. Oh, you know, just so cool, yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, 500 words about the Holy City Zoo and how it was... Uh, a, a clubhouse for comics and I thought that was so hip so the first time I came to San Francisco I, I, I did the open mic at the punchline and then the guy saw me who ran the open mic at the Holy City Zoo so I went there and he said yeah I'll put you in I saw you pretty good and um, I had to follow Robin Williams oh my who, god yeah who followed my excuse me who followed Michael Pritchard which would have been hard enough for me to follow Michael but, Richard Pritchard Pritchard, Pritchard. okay a local guy. Yeah. Uh, and then Robin came out and did 45 minutes. Jeez. And that was my first time at the zoo. So it, wow. was, it was hideous and wonderful at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then I just... It, then, and Robin was and, already big because of Mark, right? It was oh, like everybody huge. knew, yeah. yeah. And at the time in San Francisco, there were five levels. There was, uh, you were an open micer, you were an MC, you were a middle act, you were a headliner, and then you moved to L.A. And it was, it was that, it was almost rigid. And um, I didn't move to L.A. I never moved to L.A. I did, I did L.A. for three months at a time, a couple of times, because I had plays down there. But I never moved to L.A. because I was able to catch the wave, uh, the crest of the comedy wave, you know, which started in 83, 84, when... Because cable had discovered comedy, how cheap it was to produce. Right, and HBO came, and all those things. Yeah, came HBO around. on location, and then evening at the Improv a little later, and then A and E became the comedy and, and uh, Hitler Channel, <laughs> and they were doing. It was either one or the other. It was either <laughs> World War Two or they had comedy. Right. At one time, uh, evening at the Improv was on three times a day, four times a day on A&E, and they had Caroline's Comedy Hour. And all these clubs started spinning up in uh, America. And you can tell that Cable created the comedy boom because the last two cities in America to get a comedy club were the last two cities to get cable television. That was oh, wow. Cincinnati and Milwaukee. That's amazing. Yeah, and I, I was, it was just a very special time. And we comics, who had started out you know, right around 80, there was no money in it until like 83, so 84. The, uh, 84, there was 40 stand-up comedy clubs, full-time clubs in America, and I think eight of them were in the Bay Area. Oh my in gosh, 84. yeah. And then in, in 1994, there were 440 wow. full-time comedy that clubs. That was when the boom America. like yeah. happened, the yeah. where everybody started doing, yeah. opening up clubs and... Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, the, all these disco owners who had the, you know, they had the mirrored ball. Right. And then they tried the mechanical ball because the country <laughs> western thing happened yeah. with uh, uh, the John Travolta mo urban cowboy. I think Bill Maher said like it was like discos and then turned into strip clubs, comedy clubs, and then eventually a Starbucks like would pop up. <laughs> But uh, that's so amazing. So you were there for the height. I was just wondering, you brought up like Robin Williams and the Holy City Zoo. I was just wondering, what was that like? Because I know Larry Bubbles Brown was there and Johnny Steele were there. And just like all my favorite like comedians from the Bay Area at that that yeah. one time, everybody was there. It, like Dana it, Carvey. and Dana had left by 83, 84. Uh, he, he had gone down to L.A. Would you guys just walk from Holy City Zoo to Punchline and just like... Well, we, we'd always end up at the zoo. Yeah. You know, even when there was Tommy T's in San Leandro, right. and Tommy T's in Concord, and uh, there was a punchline in, in downtown, and then a punchline in Walnut Creek, and then there was a Fubars in Pleasant Hill, and there was uh, the Country Store, which became Rooster T. Feathers in Sunnyvale, 
And there was a comedy club in Napa for a while, and another one in Corte Madera. And, and these are full-time clubs. Yeah. You know? I'm not talking about the one-nighters. And then, of course, Sacramento had a punchline and a laughs unlimited. That's amazing. So you're like young, you're like 20, 30, and then you can make a full living just right here in San Francisco yeah, you doing stand-up. Yeah, you could book. In September, I would book half of the following year because they always booked their whole year in September the following year. So I would book the punchline three or four times. Wow. You know, punchline won like three or four times. Cobbs three or four times. Cobbs started in 83, I think. And yeah, you, that's so, so cool. That just, you could have 26 weeks, boom, you know, and never have to leave really. Never there. leave. No. Oh, that's like the dream. I feel like. Uh, how come you didn't want to go to L.A.? Was there reasons? Because I was uh, into the political material thing. Yeah. And in L.A., everybody was always doing their best seven minutes, and you would see the same guys do. Oh, because they want to get on like Carson or Letterman or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, you know. And that, that's why San Francisco was so special. There was no money here. And yeah. You had all these oddballs and misfits and outcasts and square pegs that didn't fit into round holes. You could, like, move the line and just keep going and trying new stuff out here. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you if you did well in San Francisco, you know, maybe some, some guy might hire you for a $500 corporate gig. You know, ooh, right. wow. But if you did well in L.A., some guy in the audience might give you 13 weeks at five grand a week. So the money was totally different yeah so uh, people in san francisco were a lot more uh, supportive and they would tell each other where gigs were yeah and and you know and just like less sort of not wait, competition but like greed i guess for and that greed uh, less uh less pressure less pressure yeah. yeah and i loved um i didn't get to see the full movie yet but i saw i came to like one of the opening nights or premieres at the Throckmorton last year, last May, and you and Larry Brown were there and Johnny Steele. Oh, three still standing. Yeah, they play yeah. like bunches of clips and it's it looks so amazing. Is it out? Can I get it on DVD? Not yet. Uh, they're, uh, we're still trying to find a distributor. Uh, we're hopefully looking towards Toronto at the end of this month, which is April Oh, wow, that would be amazing, yeah. Uh, yeah, so find a distributor down there. I only probably saw maybe 20, 30% of the movie, but it's like, it's so amazing. And it's just about mostly you three, Larry Bubbles Brown, Johnny And why Steel. we never left. And, and, why, and yeah. why we're still doing stand-up comedy, you know, even though we're not famous. And <laughs> that's, it's an amazing story, I think. It's, they, they just sort of followed you guys for like a year or? For three years. Three years. Yeah, well, two two full years and then it's been a year since they uh since that so yeah it's been a three-year process yeah and you and larry brown and john Steele, you guys kind of all came together you guys have been working yeah for a yeah, long time together we're all part of the city johnny's a little later i think i was here first and then bubble started in 81 and johnny started in 83 yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And I read on your site you did 800 TV appearances with like Letterman. At least. And at least. So cool. I, I had a couple of TV shows. How many Letterman? Uh, only to Letterman you? once. Once? Yeah. Was it on his NBC show? or? Yes, it was. Oh, that's the best. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And you did like HBO and Showtime? And yes, yes. Wow. I've clawed my way to the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I always seem to piss off the very successful uh, people and then get really cozy with uh, people who decide to get out of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's odd. Well, I love like you do like, I mean, I get your emails every week and you do like social commentary and satire and I think you're brilliant at it. And I was wondering when you go on tour, like, uh, do, do you, uh, does it translate like internet, like does it go well in, like, Alabama or, like, down there, like, Texas or something like that? Or do you kind of have to, like, hold off on some things as opposed to San Francisco? Uh, yeah, see, that's, that's, uh, we, our crowds are, are much ahead of, and that can be good and that can be bad. It's not necessarily a good thing. You know, Jerry Seinfeld compared San Francisco comics to uh, the residents of Shangri-La, if you ever saw the movie Lost Horizon, where uh, they try to leave Shangri-La and they become decrepit and old <laughs> immediately, and you know that's pretty much 
the story of uh, San Francisco comics when they go down to L.A. and because L.A. is a, a different rhythm and you know it's a it's a whole different approach. So uh, and also. San Francisco audiences aren't necessarily smarter. They just think they should be. You know, right. they consider themselves. It's like the phenomenon I discovered when I went uh, catch a rising star in Harvard Square. It used to be the best club in the country for for one reason. It was it was downstairs, so you had, so it was like a catacomb. So all the walls were brick, and oh, the wow. ceiling was a little shorter. It yeah. was like, you know like seven and a half feet instead of nine. That's and, like the perfect and, club. Yeah, and the sound, the laughs would bounce off all that brick, and because of the shorter ceiling, the laughs would funnel through and pick up steam and momentum, and the audience thought they were having a much better time than they actually were <laughs> yeah. because of the sound, the right. acoustics. Same thing with uh, the improv when it was in San Francisco on Mason and Geary and, and the Comedy Underground in Seattle, uh, and the basement rooms, man, uh, and the Hungry Eye. Uh, uh, I mean, the Purple Onion was like that. Yeah. Purple Onion. So uh, also in Harvard Square in Cambridge, they, you know, they think... Oh, we're here with Harvard students and MIT right. students. There's and, like 20 colleges in that yeah, corner. Yeah, and they think that, and it's all these mooks from the burbs who are coming <laughs> in, but they think that they gotta be, you know, up to the level of Harvard. Right. So they, you know, they think they're smarter, and then they think they're having a better time. So, <laughs> so it was a total, totally bogus experience, but it was great yeah. because of the quality of the laughs. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I love so, how you say they're not. That much more, but they, I mean, that helps because they're open to, you know, hearing the new ideas exactly. and they're ready to laugh. Exactly. And yeah. I, I wanted to ask you that too, because I feel like now just watching comedy in clubs and stuff, I feel like everybody's so um, politically correct all the time. And somebody will say a joke that's not even like bad at all, but everybody go, ooh, like, ah, like everybody's afraid to laugh. Do you feel like that's been getting worse through the years? Yes. Or, yeah. Why yeah. is that? Would you have any like sort of thoughts on that or? Oh, because it's a, uh, it's, it's ingrained in people from... Uh, Everything offends everybody. <laughs> yeah, from school, you know, from school. Oh, we can't do that. We can't say that about Bobby. Right. Know? And, oh, no, we're all, you know, and so people people are taught uh, that this is offensive. And, th see, that's that's the thing about stand-up comedy. And it, every generation of stand-up tries to break the the envelope mm -hmm. of what, it, what was okay beforehand. And that envelope has been poked so many times. It's, <laughs> it's hard to find an unpoked area. Right. And that's why the new comedy, you know, the new kids are trying to do something that people can't see on television. And there's not much that there's not much that they are unable to see on television. So uh, and that's why there's a lot of masturbation jokes. Right. And, yeah. And you know, people were entering the rape. Uh, All right. Yeah. Um, portal even though the just only people who can get away with rape jokes are women okay i think <laughs> i think that if a guy tries to do that's not no um maybe one guy one day somewhere will we'll be able to do it, it but but otherwise it's just but also i mean any comedy club after midnight you get all those jokes that yes, just start yes. coming out you got to get people's attention <laughs> Yeah, which makes sense, you know, when you're in the industry. I mean, it's, But do you it's, think that's something that's not helping comedy, going into those sort of... Since oh, everything's I, been I don't poked know. at? I, everybody's different, yeah. you know. If, I mean, uh, Andrew Dice Clay and Sam Kennison right. were so extreme. And, and so, you know, I think you can be extreme if you do it well. You know, it, it's the problem, you know. Most comics aren't original. They, they are... And, and, and you figure you filter it, you filter anything through who you are and will come out original. But I remember when Stephen Wright first hit and everybody tried to do that laconic kind of yeah. sideways. But if you met Stephen Wright, he's really like that. Yeah. That's an organic character. <laughs> him, yeah. Same thing with Bobcat Goldthwait. He's really like that. Yeah. Not as extreme. Right. But, he, but, you know, I mean, that's it's an organic seed. And, and Emo Phillips is really like that. So for all these other people to pretend to do that, or, or when Seinfeld was popular, we called him a sweater comic. And that <laughs> Why was, is that? What is that? I don't know. He, always, <laughs> he seemed to wear a sweater a lot. Um, 
So we called him a sweater comic, <laughs> and everybody was a sweat. Everybody wanted to be a sweater comic, oh, my, you know, because yeah. because uh, he was doing it. Yeah, yeah, because they all tried to do the observational stuff. Right. But Seinfeld is such a technician. Oh, He's yeah. So good it's at just that. I mean, formulas. he formulas. Microsc- yeah, but if you saw the movie uh, Comedian, mm-hmm. you know, where he develops a whole set. I mean, you can see him. So I mean, everybody's going to try to, you know, and. Seven eighths of what you see out there is going to be dreck. Yeah, you know, just like in every field. recycled something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and one eighth is going to stand out and be original. You know, it's just the way of the world. Yeah, I always say that it's like like music. Like everybody's learning the Hendrix licks, the Keith Richards licks, and eventually you'll become like Jack White or something like that. But everything comes exactly. from something. Like yeah, the, yeah. The thing is, uh, you know, all these beautiful people are trying to do stand-up comedy. And, <laughs> and dude, you're too pretty to yeah. do stand-up. You know, we're not buying the, oh, I'm so... B-. No, That's my it, biggest pet peeve. When somebody comes up, like, oh, come on. It's yeah. an actor. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, Whitney Cummings is gorgeous. Yeah. And, and she, oh, I'm a dork. No, you're not. <laughs> and and then they have all these beautiful people who are... Uh, and, and it comes off as smug. Yeah. And they don't realize it. Dude... <laughs> You can't do. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. You're thing. too pretty. Yeah. You know, deal with it. <laughs> You're too pretty for comedy, when John which is Hamm- something you and I will never be accused right, yeah, of. Yeah, we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> when John Hamm? Oh, that's how, when John Hamm, uh, he came on like 30 Rock, the Tina Fey show. I was like, oh my gosh, he's funny too. Come on. He's I know, a great actor. But he's, he's really looking- short. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Gotta have one thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to ask you real quick. Um, I love all your albums and... Uh, you always have new stuff coming in, and uh, well, I was wondering what your writing process was like, especially since you do more topical jokes. And I'm so lazy. <laughs> uh, I get to ask this all the time, and I'm embarrassed. But uh, I have deadlines, so I have to come up with these commentaries every week. And uh, so, the last three weeks, it's been pretty easy to come up with a topic. Because it's been handed to me. Yeah. Uh, Iran, know. all those, everything. Yeah, yeah three news. weeks ago it was Bush Clinton. Uh, two weeks ago it was Ted Cruz announcing. And then last week it was Indiana. Oh, so yeah. it's always being handed. Th- and I try to focus on national stuff, not international stuff, because I have no idea what the the peace talks were. Right. Iran. I'm sorry, man. I have no <laughs> idea what that is about. So They I don't know either. It's okay. I, I know. <laughs> No, sanctions? What sanctions? Uh, a year? A year? What? So uh, nobody knows. Uh, not even John Kerry. So uh, on Thursday, I have to come up with 300 words, and then it used to be Wednesday, but I moved the deadline back. Uh, and that, and then I read it in my computer. I fashion it into a commentary. Hey guys, Will Durst here with a few choice words about blah blah, and then I do. Hopefully, I, I write them with jokes, because it's got to sound like my voice right. doing jokes. And then I do different tags at the end. So, uh, for Radio Parallax, I'm Will Durst. For Howie's Freaky Fat Friday, I'm Will Durst. So I do that 12 times, and I send them out to 12 different stations. But then I have a kernel for the column. So, uh, after I strip out all the, the radio stuff, uh, it, I end up with about 250 words, and... Uh, that's the the seed mm-hmm. for my column that I'm going to write most of the time, and the column has to be 550 to 600 words, and then it's two different voices: the commentary and uh, the column. Uh, but then I, I on Friday I write the column, send that out to the syndicator. It's syndicated by something called Kegel Cartoons, and that goes out to um, a bunch of newspapers, and I don't know how many print them, maybe 30 a week. Here's what amazes me. You, you're writing all this, and you're sending them out, and I spend you know like hours writing, and I never actually know what's funny until like I I think something is hilarious. I'll take it to club. Like, oh no, not at all. How but long have you been doing it? Just two years, okay. nothing at all. But I was okay. gonna say, when was it for you? When you? Just... I've been doing this for forty-one <laughs> years. Yeah. Uh, you get a handle on it, and that's. Is there a moment where you just you write something? You're like, oh yeah, that'll that's gonna work. Like you just know, like. Yeah. I have a joke, and I can't remember what it is, but I love it. that must be a great feeling. And the audience, uh, and I, I don't care. I'm going to make them love it. And what is it? Is it, uh, is it uh, Ted Cruz? Is it George Bush? Oh, it's George Bush. It, it's Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush. Uh, 
uh, Jeb Bush, uh, going to be the third Bush. Not going to happen. I doubt if America would elect a third Roosevelt. And the Republicans <laughs> keep saying, oh, yeah, but, you know, Hillary Clinton's, a, she's a sequel, too. Well, there's a difference between a third Bush and a first woman. Um, <laughs> the only woman that Republicans... Uh, would would ever consider is Barbara Bush, and not as a candidate, but as a production facility. <laughs> I love production facility. I think that's, and the audience isn't quite sure yet. And I think I'm gonna, I I think in like four or five months, I'm gonna have the rhythm. And yeah, I'm gonna know how to approach it, and I might change the ramp. To Just get that there. word, production facility. Production <laughs> facility is hysterical. I agree. Yeah. That's such a great joke. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I've, I've only tried it a couple, twice. I've only tried it twice. And I haven't known quite how to get to it, but uh, that's what this week at the Punchline is about. So I have to, do, I have to stop focusing on the two one-man shows, uh, wow. which are... Yeah. Boomer Raging and the new one, Durst Case Scenario, which I'm not even quite sure what... It is as a show, and now I have to focus on my stand-up this week. My gosh, that's incredible! So it's, many. It's it's my career. It's yeah. my job. Wow. It's it's just different facets of it, and I've accepted, you know, all the responsibility for getting good at all these things. And if you can't handle the responsibility, then you, you don't accept it. Yeah. And you just work. You just, you know, it's. You ever see the. The guy who spun the plates on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's got like seven plates in the air, and he's he's got to go back and keep spinning yeah. each one. You wow. know. That's well, maybe totally he started do, out yeah. with six. Right. You know, maybe he only realized that. Oh, wait, well, yeah, I think I can do seven. You know? <laughs> seven will kill. <laughs> <I do laughs> yeah. Seven. Well, how come he doesn't do fourteen? Right. You know, yeah. he can't do fourteen apparently. <laughs> Thank so. you so much, Mr. Durst. I well, really appreciate it. it. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, yeah. Thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And when do I get to see you? Uh. <laughs> Maybe in 10, 10, 15 years. I don't know. <laughs> when do I get to see you? Up here? Punchline? Uh, no, never. I don't know. Molly? Uh, I might do brainwash maybe, but we'll see. This week? No, I'm going back tomorrow to L.A., unfortunately. How do you get to come back here? Uh, I, I went to school here, so then I just come and visit my friends like, and you crash with, with them. Friends? Yeah. Cool, cool. And I, I try to do something when I come up here. But Where'd you go? State? So, no, I went right here, USF. USF? Just up the street, yeah. And In what? Business marketing. The opposite of comedy. <laughs> but kind of the same. Not theater? <laughs> yeah, it is kind of the same. Uh, yeah. No, I wish. I, I discovered it honestly so late. I, I would do cartoons for the. I kind of would do the same. Oh, I would cool. do political cartoons for the newspaper. And then um, the improv team was like, oh, yeah, you can come. And I've never performed before. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. And then I sort of got used to that. And then I was like, I'll do stand up because I love it so much. Are you still cartooning? Uh, not as much, but I'm going to get back into it. Have and you ever thought about doing a slideshow on stage? I've actually thought of that, yeah, because Dimitri Martin has that paper that he pulls back, and I thought about doing it that way. Cause yeah, yeah. I, I worked at the dorm, as a doorman, and the guys who had the PowerPoint stuff, like, it was always a huge hassle, and, like, yeah, you know, yeah. the technical aspect of it freaks well, me out. So the it, paper, like... That's I why think, I use an overhead projector in my, oh, yeah, yeah. my one-man show. You just plug it in, and it's good just to... Just plug go. it in, and then I run it. And it's, do you, you do know, cartoons as I well? I do the transparencies. Uh, no. no. Well, if you ever need an illustrator or something, All right. let me know. All right. Yeah, but maybe something like that one day would be fun. Shoot me some of your shit. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs>